now that we have an understanding of Thompson's views and her arguments for those views, I want to conclude by considering the ways in which people have objected to her arguments. That is to say, the ways in which other philosophers, other thinkers, have criticized her arguments. Um, some of these criticisms uh, are obviously going to come from pro-life thinkers, but others of these criticisms come from pro-choice thinkers, in fact. Um, there are pro-choice thinkers who think that while she might have the conclusion correct in certain ways, she might be correct that abortion is morally permissible, the reasons she gives for that conclusion don't work. Other pro-choice thinkers have thought that and so have criticized her arguments. So what we're gonna do now is consider the two main kinds of objection uh, that people have raised against Thompson's argument. So what I have up there is that, I don't know, that kind of diagram, if you will, of her argument that we've um, uh, considered previously. Uh, I just have the violinist one, but as we're gonna talk about, and as should become clear, much, many of the same things could be said about the people seeds argument as we're gonna say about the violinist argument. And we're actually gonna talk a little bit about the people seeds argument. But just for the sake of illustration, I just have the violinist argument up there. The first kind of objection that people have raised <clears throat> is they have claimed that, or tried to argue, that the intuition drawn out from the thought experiment is false. They have denied that, the intuition right there. And so they have tried to stop the argument, if you will, at that point. Fine, tell your story about the violinist, that's all great and good, but the intuition that you pull out of it it's false. It's not actually true. And so if you recall the intuition that Thompson pulls out of the violinist thought experiment is the claim that it's morally permissible to unplug oneself from the violinist. So the first kind of objection uh, would object by saying that's false. That is to say, the first kind of objection would claim that it's morally impermissible to unplug yourself from the violinist. Now, the first thing I want to say about this, about this kind of objection, is that appeals to intuition are liable to be objected to in this way. And Thompson's paper is full of appeals to intuition. Whenever you see her see, saying things like, well, surely you'd have to admit that, or clearly we should say blah, blah, blah. No one could possibly think whatever, right? All those words, all those uh, words or phrases, uh, what she's indicating with them is that she's appealing to an, an intuition that she thinks is just, you know, beyond, the shadow, beyond a shadow of a doubt. It's just clear as day. So in the case of the violinist thought experiment, <clears throat> she, I think, I uh, uh, can't remember exactly, I believe she says something like, it'd be outrageous to deny something like that. Well, people have. And since all that Thompson gives us in the article, at least, is the thought experiment and the intuition that's drawn out of it, it's unclear what else she might say. Surely you'd have to think that it's okay to unplug yourself. And if someone were saying, no, I don't, I don't think it's okay to unplug yourself. Yeah, it's a horrible situation, but no, you got to stay plugged in. At that point, it seems like we just reach a, a butting of heads. At the very least, Thompson in her paper doesn't give any further argumentation for the intuition that she draws out. She thinks it's just obvious. Now, in the case of the violinist, you might think, well, I don't know, that's a pretty hard sell. I mean, that, to deny that intuition, that's, uh, I mean, that seems pretty clear that it seems pretty clear that you could unplug yourself and, okay. I think a bigger problem uh, or a stronger objection along these lines could be made against the uh, people seeds thought experiment. 
right? So when she runs the people seeds thought experiment, the intuition she draws out is that clearly it's okay to vacuum up the people seeds. And the way that somebody might object along these kind of this, this first kind of objection that we're considering would be to say, no, it's not permissible to vacuum them up. And if she tried to insist that, no, look, it clearly, you could, uh, is it really that clear? Part of the problem is that that thought experiment is so out of this world. It's so bizarre. I mean, people seeds floating around like pollen and they're people, but they're like pollen. And then they take root in your carpet. I, I don't know. Is it okay to vacuum up? I have no idea. I don't know. This is really weird. Nothing like this ever happens in life. I have no idea whether it's okay to vacuum them up or not, right? That would be a way of motivating this idea that the intuition might be false. At the very least, it's not so clear that these intuitions are true. And if that's granted, well, then Thompson's argument would fall apart. The last thing I want to mention uh, in discussing this first kind of objection is that uh, there are people, so I just kind of shifted attention to the people seeds thought experiment. There are people who deny, that, who deny this intuition with regard to the violinist. The person we're reading next week is just such a person, Peter Singer. He himself is also uh, pro-choice, uh, but he thinks Thompson's arguments don't work. And he thinks the violinist thought experiment doesn't work. Why? Because that intuition is false. And I might think, well, okay, fine. It's uh, all well and good for you to say that. But, I mean, it really seems like that intuition's true. So can you, you know, hum a few more bars? Tell us a little bit more about that, Peter Singer. He will. He'll say some things about it. And so we'll consider that uh, next week. All right. So that's the first kind of uh, objection that people have raised. They've denied the intuition. The second kind of, uh, of objection admits the intuition. The second kind of objection will say, no, Thompson, you're right. It is morally permissible to unplug from the violinist. We'll go with you as far as that goes. But the second kind of objection gets off the train, so to speak, right after that point. Next stop. The second kind of objection, and we talked about this, or I kind of hinted towards this um, earlier in an earlier video. The second kind of objection claims that that intuition doesn't tell us anything about abortion in pregnancy. The second kind of objection claims that the violinist case, or the people seeds case, whichever one you want, right? But the violinist case is disanalogous from pregnancy that unplugging from the violinist is disanalogous from aborting a fetus. And so whatever we want to say about the violinist case, well, that's all fine and good. It doesn't tell us anything about abortion. The two cases are disanalogous. They don't shed light on each other. And so in particular, the violinist case doesn't shed any light on um, the ethics of abortion. Now, the challenge, uh, right, so stops there, <clears throat> tries to deny the application of the intuition to the case of abortion. Now the challenge with this objection um, is to say how exactly they're disanalogous. Because Thompson has crafted these thought experiments very carefully and very closely. And she's crafted them, or tried to, craft them in such a way that any dissimilarity between, say, the violinist scenario and then pregnancy, any dissimilarity is supposed to be morally irrelevant. She's tried to craft it in that way. If you're going to raise something like this second objection, what you've got to find is some dissimilarity <clears throat> between the two cases that is morally relevant some dissimilarity that makes it such that unplugging might be unplugging from the violinist might very well be permissible while abortion might not be 
And the most common way of spelling out this objection, of spelling out what that dissimilarity might be, Thompson herself anticipates. The most common way of trying to spell out this objection is to claim that while well, the relevant disanalogy, the relevant dissimilarity between pregnancy and the violinist is that in the case of pregnancy, the woman is the mother to the fetus, whereas in the case of the violinist, there's absolutely no biological relation between you and the violinist. And then kind of pushing the point further, the idea would be, well, in virtue of being the mother of the fetus, the woman has a, quote, special responsibility for the fetus. These are Thompson's words. So Thompson herself anticipates this objection. She's um, aware that somebody might try to press an objection in this way. And in fact, what we're going to see is a later uh, uh, later thinkers are going to press this objection. So we're going to read uh, two weeks. Robbie George and uh, Patrick Lee, <clears throat> uh, who argue for a pro-life position, they are going, going to object to Thompson along these lines. They flesh, out, flesh it out in more detail than I'm going to right now. We'll pay attention to that when we turn to it in a few weeks. But the basic idea here is the woman in virtue of being the fetus's mother has a special responsibility for the fetus. And so it's not okay for the mother to kind of withdraw her support from the fetus. It's not okay for the mother to unplug from the fetus while it may very well be okay for the mother, for that same woman to unplug from a violinist, from the violinist, right? Because she doesn't have any special responsibility for the violinists. That's the disanalogy. Now, as I was saying, Thompson herself anticipates this objection, and so she gives a reply. So she already, in her article from 1971, um, there's a reply to this kind of objection. What Thompson claims is that surely we do not have any such special responsibility unless we have assumed it explicitly or implicitly. <clears throat> what that means is that in order for a woman to have, so Thompson's going to say that, um, you know, I have kids. And so she would say that me, I have, meet Jeff, right? I'm not speaking in Thompson's voice. Me, I have a special responsibility for my kids. Thompson would say, yes, that's true. I do. And I do because I'm, uh, I'm their father. But what she would say is that I have assumed that, I've welcomed that, I've taken that on. I have either explicitly or implicitly accepted that responsibility, and that's why I have a special responsibility for my children. And uh, so, and you don't, right? Uh, because you never accepted that responsibility for my children. You don't even know my children, right? So, of course, you never accepted responsibility for them. And so, you don't have this special responsibility for them. And so, if they grew up to be these world famous violinists who got plugged into you, you could unplug from them no problem. Right? It would be something like the <clears throat> idea. Um, because you never assumed a special responsibility. But me, I did, and so no, I couldn't, or I'm responsible for them. I, I've got to care for them. And so in the case of uh, pregnancy, Thompson's idea is that the woman, at some point, somehow, perhaps implicitly or explicitly, I think in more cases than not, it's going to be implicit, it's not, um, grants or assumes this special responsibility for the fetus, right? It's not as though a woman in pregnancy ever sits down and, you know, says, I assume responsibility for the fetus, right? That would be explicit assumption of um, the special responsibility. And of course, the woman never does that. Uh, but implicitly in any number of ways, she assumes uh, responsibility for it. <clears throat> Now, what this uh, view of Thompson, so we're going to discuss this um, uh, objection and Thompson's reply in greater detail um, later when we get to George and Lee.
But one thing I want to point out about it right now is simply that it assumes a whole lot. It assumes a particular view of human beings, a particular view of human relationships, and a particular view of the source of our obligations to others. It assumes that human beings are in some sense uh, born as individuals. We are these individuals and we can choose to enter into relationships or not. And it's our so choosing that generates obligations between people. That's the source of our obligations to others. It's this assumption or this um, acceptance of relationships between us. And so in the case of pregnancy, the mother accepts the responsibility for her, uh, for the fetus, um, she accepts that relationship, and that's what grounds the responsibilities, according to Thompson. 